I, I literally have goosebumps. I mean, I, I literally do. Um, I told you that you would also be in awe of these two incredible leaders. Um, what a way to open up this workshop. All right, well, let's get into it a little bit. Um, I mean, you heard some some very, very thoughtful and cogent perspectives on, on the work of these movements that these two leaders um, shepherd. Let me let me ask both Ijin and Latasha to speak a little bit about this, you know, concept, Latasha, that you had gotten into, and Ijin, I've I've certainly heard you speak about before. Obviously, racism, anti-immigrant sentiment, um, sexism shapes the perceptions of the the constituents, the the, the folks that you organize, um, shapes how how policymakers view those constituents. And um, some of that stigma, that devaluation, the dehumanization is internalized by the very people that you work with. Tell us a little bit about how you approach that uh, with that awareness that, you know, people have experienced the oppression, the trauma of racism and all of the various isms that have essentially trapped them uh, in, in a way of thinking about their own power. How do you approach that from the perspective of, of leading your movements? Maybe we'll start with Ijen. Sure, Tony. Um, I'm also so moved by everything Latasha said, and I think it speaks directly to your question, which is that really our job, all of our jobs should be to create the context for people to connect to their agency and their power. And, um, and that's really what we do all day, every day, is to figure out how we, through community, through connection, and through action, actually create the context for people to understand just how powerful they are and just how much value um, they offer, unique value they offer to our communities, to the work that they do, and to our country as a whole. And that's what our campaigns are about. That's what our programs are about. And I think that sense of community and connection that we create is not just about power, but is about that sense of self, that sense of belonging, that sense of um, collective confidence that we are and can be powerful together and can actually change the conditions of our lives. I see. What's up, Sasha? So I am, you know, it's always beautiful in Jamaica, but then it doesn't always work. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I think it's the same thing. I think, I, you know, I think it's twofold. I think on some level, um, the, the, the real change is actually around this, this notion of value. I really believe that. Like, we can figure everything else out, <laughs> right? We, we can figure out how to create something. We can figure out, you know, how do you, but when you have a culture when you have a society that organizes itself in a way that says there are there's are some human life that doesn't have value that's when you have homelessness that's when you have people not being exploited for their labor that's when you have people not having health care that's when you have folks that don't have food quite frankly that's when you have an earth that you're actually destroying with climate change because part of what happens is we it is a value system that is eroded that at the end of the day the only thing that really matters is success winning and money and not human life and so my point is if we all and 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 this and let me say this in no way am i saying this in a context of self-righteousness that on the day-to-day -day basis i have to also really deal with myself or where oppression lives you know i you know there was a a, a short story i'll just share that i was in um in atlanta georgia and i was um, at Gladys Knight Chicken and Waffles. I was going, going on, on on a diet and this was my, my one cheat meal. And so in this cheat meal, I was walking in, there was a homeless man that was sitting outside eating food. Someone had given him this food. I went inside, ate my food. But of course, if you know about a cheat meal, I didn't want to eat it all because it was the only cheat meal I had. I, I saved it so I could eat it later. And so as I was going outside, this same man 
who I greeted going in, who was eating food, Gladys Knight chicken and waffles. He actually asked me for my food. Well, it, a, a culture from my family in the deep South, if someone asked me for food, I have to oblige. It doesn't matter who it is. If you ask me for food, I've got to feed you. It doesn't matter what I've got to stop what I'm doing and feed you. And so I have, because of my culture, my family culture, I've got to give him my food. So I begrudgingly gave him my food. And I was like, you probably eat better than me. And he looked at me and he said, what I shouldn't, and it messed me up. I couldn't sleep that night. I, it bothered me at first. My, my first reaction was I was became defensive. Like, why would you say that to me? Because I'm a social justice activist. I fight for, um, fight around social justice. But the truth of the matter is, there was something I was saying. When I said to him, you eat better than, you probably eat better than me. Embedded in that is I had this belief that in some way, because I worked hard and I worked every day that I was, um, it was important that I should be eating better than he should eat because he was a homeless man. Now I would never say that, but that belief lived in me and it was in that moment that it got revealed to me. And since that time, I'm constantly waking up, recognizing that I am trained in a particular kind of context and how does oppression live in me? And so I think part of what we have to do is while we're seeking to change the work, we've got to do our work, right? That there's no way that we can live in a culture of America where we know that capitalism rules, that everything is, that human value in many ways is secondary to a whole bunch of other things, but to material wealth, entertain a whole bunch of other things that we have to really be able to figure out how do we have start that transformation process within ourselves? Because my belief is there's a tipping point. There's a critical mass that at the point, not everybody, but at the point that the critical mass accept human value, we will not tolerate folks not being paid. We will not tolerate people being exploited. We will not tolerate electors. But the truth of the matter is part of what led to a Trump, what led to children being placed in cages is that there's a certain level of complicitness that we have because we also have accepted that there's some human life that has more value than others. Wow, there's so many, so many ways to explore this with the two of you. It's, uh, it's, it's. I'm overwhelmed. Um, let's pivot to some of the questions from the audience, and I'm going to start with. Um, and, and keep in mind that our audience is uh, largely people that are in the health field, um, probably more aware and understand many of these concepts intellectually. However, they many struggle to figure out how to apply uh, some of what uh, you're learning in your work to their work. So let me start with this first question. What strategies have you used to diffuse new narratives to the greater public to shift mindsets? And then it goes on to say, how have you employed the narratives to support civic engagement, culture change, innovation, and policy? Um, we can start with either of you. Um, why don't we give um, Latasha a break? I, Jen, and you want to take a crack at that one? Sure. I think it's um, really important to understand and or try to uh, analyze what are the narratives, the dominant narratives that um, that we actually have to do away with, and um, and challenge and and replace with something else and you know, the dominant narratives that devalue human life, that see some forms of work as real work and others as less than, some people as more human than others, right? There are dominant narratives um, with deep, deep roots about who works, who matters, um, that I think we have to uncover. And then we have to think about what we want to replace them with. And that's where Latasha's exercise around vision was really helpful, right? And we should always be challenging ourselves to think about what should the dominant narrative be that actually affirms everyone's value, that actually affirms and supports public health, that really affirms our dignity and our wellness um, and and figure out how you start to put those narratives in the environment um, from your day-to-day -day life to the media to popular culture, 
really trying to build a new kind of narrative momentum around the narratives that should shape our future rather than the ones that keep the status quo in place. I, I just add um, ditto to everything that Ajahn just said. You know, I, you know, I always say this, um, that culture will eat strategy for breakfast. <laughs> that you can have these wonderful, great plans if it's not in alignment with what is indigenous, whatever that culture is where you are, people won't grab hold. And why is it? Why is it that culture works? You know, culture does exactly what Ajahn just said. It affirms. You know, if you come from a community and there's a certain way that you all fry your pancakes, you can. If you go to Europe and they're cooking the pancakes the same way, there's something that makes you excited about it. What makes you excited? It's not really the pancakes. It's the fact that that they're affirming you. Like you all cook your pancakes like that too. Oh my goodness! It's something that says that 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 what you are doing makes sense. Something that says what you're doing has value. And so I think it's really important when we're talking about even the work, um, even in the healthcare space, I think there's a couple of things. One, you know, I think we have to really be able to lean into culture and not let com culture just be a commodity in the entertainment industry, <laughs> but that actually use culture as a way that we communicate, to actually use culture as a way in which we affirm people, right? Use culture as a way of where we actually help people plug into power in place. You know, there's something, the reason why we like to travel is that when you come to Jamaica, right? And some, and you, if I came to Jamaica and people act just like they were in the U.S., it would be deeply disappointing to us, right? We don't come to the U. We, I don't come to to Jamaica to hear the same accent in Atlanta. I don't come here to get the same kind of grits and 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 bacon. I come here. I want to wear the oxtails. I want the fresh fish with the eyes still in it. I want someone to say, hey, mom, right? There's something beautiful. And when we see people operate in that authentic voice of culture that actually affirms, and I'm raising this, you know, if I go to Europe, when I'm going to France, there's something about I'm, I'm in with the way that they walk, the way that they sway. There's something about the restaurants and sitting outside. My point is that we all are intrigued that the one space that almost forces us to recognize the value in someone else is through culture. And so I think the best organizing tool is actually being able to use culture in a way that's not just about entertainment, but it's really about affirming. It's about how you also use popular education. And pop so that, that part of what oftentimes happens is that part of the way that there's an approach of counter -nar narrative where you're still centering the very negative that you're trying to get away from, right? So that you're creating a counter narrative, but the negative is still in the center and it's all in response to that. You know, for us, the way that we wanted to do is shift the whole notion and center the people in the communities that we were working in, right? And so that uh, what you can do is actually center a conversation that is really around building a narrative out that gives people a sense of hope, for people to actually, there's something about when we're able to imagine. That's why we like Disney worlds and, and, and cartoons. There's something powerful around this gift of imagination. And so what I'm offering, offering is that oftentimes in these spaces, you know, we want to get to the hard science, right? Let's do the hard science around it without really recognizing that culture is a part of a science. Culture is a science that has been created and perfected over thousands of years by a particular people based on a particular environment based on a particular similar experience, there's power in that. And it's emotional. And I, it's, I, I think in this space, um, oftentimes we rely on the data and the arguments and the research, and we think we're going to research our way towards equality. And at the end of the day, we're trying to, tra we're trying to change humans, people, who are whole and are emotional. And yes, we have our factual minds and our rational minds, but we have also an enormous landscape of an emotional life. And if we can't reach people as humans at that level, we're not gonna actually achieve the change that we want. Ditto, ditto, ditto. There are a lot of audience members are just clamoring for more of this. They're saying they love this. This is exactly what they needed to hear. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about um, institutions and moving institutions. You, you, you both have formidable opponents, if you will. Um, you know, you have a legislature and, and a you know, government apparatus in Georgia that's appears to be intent on suppressing voters. 
and 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 keeping people out of the electoral electoral sphere. And Aijin, you're certainly working up uh, against a series of institutions that have viewed this, you know, this workforce that you've so eloquently described as expendable, disposable, um, largely irrelevant uh, in the policy space. And you're both taking on massive institutions and institutional norms. Uh, Aijin, you talk about disruptive power. Tell us a little bit more about that for those of us that work in the health institutions and are trying to disrupt an understanding of how health is created. Well, if ever there was a time <laughs> to do it, it's now, <laughs> because we're experiencing the most significant disruption to the way that we live, work, and care in this country, certainly in my lifetime with this pandemic. And in the midst of this disruption that, you know, no one, none of us created except for some people in power made worse, um, that there is opportunity, I think, to set new norms and to create new behaviors, new narratives, even the fact that we are now talking about essential workers. Before, before the pandemic, there was an epidemic of low wage work in America where you had millions of people working incredibly hard and still can't pay the rent, can't pay for food, can't pay for the basics. And what this pandemic revealed is that not only is that real dignified work, but it's actually essential to our safety and to our survival. That opening, the disruption of the pandemic created an opening. And it's really on us to figure out how we take those openings and deliver real change, cement those narratives into policy, into new behaviors, new norms, new practices. And it, it's gonna take all of us. And I think the, the health sector is really gonna set the pace. If, if in this sector, we don't fight for racial and gender equity, coming out of this pandemic, that's this is the tip of the spear for how we recover from the pandemic. So I think you have an incredible moment of opportunity right now. The disruption has arrived. You don't have to figure out how to create it. And the question is how to pull the thread towards equity and justice. Latasha, we, we have about five, four minutes left and uh, we'd love to hear your response to the same question about institutions. Um, one of the public questioners also asked about philanthropy. How do you get philanthropy to fund this work, to understand the importance of this work? Um, so if you can touch on that as well, Latasha, uh, okay. and maybe we can circle back to Aijin around that, knowing that you're on the board of the Ford Foundation and, and are very experienced in this. So if you can touch on both of those issues, that would be great. So I will try to be brief. That's a whole that's a that's a whole workshop itself um, around philanthropy. That's actually the world in which I come out of. <laughs> so um, on, on some level, I'll just briefly say that institutions are created by people. People can change and so can institutions. Right. People change when their values change. And when people change and their values change, the institution values will change. And so I'm raising that because I think that this really is. I think it all goes back to what I said earlier. I think part of what has to happen is is that we've actually made the outcome be greater than the purpose, right? And so that we will put programs over people. <laughs> we will put processes over people and be attached to those processes and those programs and not necessarily people themselves. I'll, in the spirit of what Ajin just shared, I think we have been given a gift in this moment that we're in a transfer. My grandfather often says, you know, would say, you know, he's a man that lived to be 104 years old and got up and did two toe touches every day. And that was his exercise. It was an excellent shape. <laughs> Hell, he would say, you know, um, until the pain and the same becomes greater than the pain to change, people will, ever, will never change. So right now, this discomfort that we're feeling is actually a gifting. It is a gifting for us to reorder our thinking around how do we move forward? How do we use science in a way that is not just advancing um, uh, uh, health outcomes in the context of from tech, from a tech but how can we actually use science to be the very um, the very foundation with factual proof of when people are treated better, all of us benefit. 
the, the world does better, right? So how do we use, how do we use our, our, our gifting in this moment to have a real reflect, to be very reflective um, around how we need institutional change and do we new, new, need new institutions? Sometimes we're attached to institutions that are no longer needed, right? Because they no longer serve a function. And so what we wound up doing is being more attached to the institution, right? Instead of the outcome. I am looking for the day that Black Voters Matter is no longer needed. That is my goal. My goal is to come out of business. My Ajahn's goal, I'm quite sure, is that women who are women and men and people who are doing this work, that there will be no longer need for a national domestic workers, right? And so that's what our work has to be. I think it's all still has to be centered around kind of this vision conversation. Okay, well, we're, we're, we're out of time. And um, we, you know, our plan was, our hope was to kick this workshop off with a bang. And man, did we succeed. Um, the, the comments are enthusiastic. Uh, they want more of these two leaders. Uh, I want to thank Latasha and Igen for just being who you are and, and, and leading from your, your authentic essence and inspiring so many of us. I mean, you, you really, you make my skin kind of tingle with just sort of the excitement that there are people like you in the world leading these incredible movements. I just, I just want to get behind you and, and follow you. Um, this has been exciting. There are some questions in the uh, that have come up around uh, how do we address working class whites? You know, how's COVID impacting um, you know the work that both of you do? I think you're going to hear from some of the subsequent speakers. Um, you know, approaches to that. We couldn't get to every question today. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this opening, and we hope that you'll stay with us. So I think I'm turning it back to I don't know, perhaps uh, Bobby Milstein.